Good to be with uh, with y'all. Uh, y'all turn to Philippians chapter 3. As y'all turn to Philippians chapter 3, I got a couple of things, a couple of good news announcements that need to be made. So uh, everything's Facebook official, so I can finally talk about it. But uh, with that, we have uh, the churches growing. Uh, Brooke and Evan are having another baby. And so, amen. All right. <laughs> you clapping too. Evan didn't clap at all. <laughs> Strange. That's weird. And uh, the, uh, the other good news announcement that we have is we have a wedding coming up. Miss Riley Walker is engaged to Mr. Caleb Blackston. And so uh, that engagement happened uh, last night, right? And, uh, and so we're looking forward to that as well. <laughs> all right. We love weddings, we love babies, so we celebrate them just the same as God celebrates them. So with that, uh, and, and I'm praying for the rest of y'all, we got more babies coming, I'm praying for the rest of y'all, y'all just wait. So, The um, Philippians chapter 3, and in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I've counted for loss, for Christ. For yet indeed I also count the things loss and excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained or have already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing, I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if, any, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us have the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have, have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together into your house during this time. And Father, we ask that as we do, Father, that you would... Continue to bless us, Father, that you would bless us uh, with all the trappings of this world, Father, that you would give to us all the good and righteous things. But ultimately, Father, that the most treasured and the most valued thing that we ask to be blessed with is with yourself. Father, that you'd bless us with your presence. You'd bless us with your wisdom. You'd bless us with your character. Father, that you would continue to bless us, to, to grow us, to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ that you would guide us and correct us with your word and with your Holy Spirit, that we can be more like you every day. Lord, that we can shine your light into this dark world in which you've placed us, that we can carry your gospel with us in every area that we go, in every place, in every friendship, 
that we go, Father, that we would carry Christ with us. And Lord, that we would see a great harvest of souls for your kingdom and great glory and honor for your name. In all things, Lord, we pray only because of the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so here we are. We're in the book of Philippians, and, uh, and we're kind of halfway through. We're kind of drawing down the thoughts, as we see in verse 1. He says, finally, and then he continues on like a uh, Baptist pastor for another couple of chapters. But uh, in that, we started out with Paul in prison, and here he's writing to this church at Philippi, and he's telling them that he knows that they're persecuted. He knows that they're enduring hardship. He knows the, the pressure that is all around God's people and that he is thankful for them, that he is prayerful for them, but that his prayerfulness is that they would be discerning. Because anytime there is pressure and anytime there's persecution, then there's always the, the, uh, the want of the flesh to conform, to be normal, to, to, be, uh, to fit in with the crowd. And so here it, he's telling them that he wants them to be discerning, that they will continue on right paths, not just the almost right paths. That's what discernment is, is being able to tell right from almost right. Any, any goober can tell right from wrong. It's telling right from almost right. We want to live in righteousness of God's righteousness by his definition. He moves on and gives them a mentality to live by. And he says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we talked about how that is completely contrary to the world in which we live today. Even in the, the uh, Bible-saturated South, what we often end up uh, teaching is to live is gain, to die is Christ. That we should live our lives trying to accumulate stuff and get rich and, and, and just get an armful of everything that this world has to offer. And that we live our lives gaining, 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 gaining. And then at our death, then some preacher gets up and lies and says that our life was about Christ. And we hope to live a selfish, self-centered, secular, carnal life, but then die and have a glorious afterlife. Paul says that is completely contrary. To live is Christ. Christ has spoken words for every area of our life. There is nowhere in our life where God has not spoken his will, his wisdom, and his directives for his people. To live is Christ. All of Christ for all of life. And then when we die, that's actually a gain for us. That's a prosperous endeavor for the Christian. When we die, we're better off than we've ever lived. We have it better in death than we've ever had in life. To live is Christ. To die is gain. We talked about last week uh, with him commending his fellow ministers and that he talks about Timothy and he talks about uh, Epaphroditus and that those are two different guys. Timothy kind of born and raised in the church, uh, you know, uh, just had a pedigree that you could uh, wish for. He was Paul's right hand man. He was like a son in the Lord to Paul. And then we got Epaphroditus who's named after the false god Aphrodite. Didn't grow up in church, didn't grow up with the, with the same culture. But with that, Paul still reaches out and he says, that's my brother too. That's my fellow minister. That's my fellow soldier. And so he wants this unity around that, that man, if we have the same God, if we're worshiping the same God, if, if we're uh, questing towards the same thing, then we are brothers. Even if they dress a little different, look a little different, they're our brother. We have more in common with the persecuted Christians in China than most of you have with your own families that you'll see at Thanksgiving. The ones who love Christ, the ones who suffer for Christ, the ones who obey him are your brothers and sisters in the spirit. And the spirit is eternal. The flesh is temporal. Then he goes on in, verse, in chapter 3. He opens up with these words and he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. He says, sometimes I got to repeat myself. And sometimes we got to talk about the same thing over and over and over again. And it's not a tiresome thing. Rather, it's a safe thing. Sometimes we got to make sure we understand the basics. Sometimes we got to make sure that we've got the foundation right before we start putting up rafters. And before we, we do anything else, we got to make sure that we're on a good level footing. So tedious instruction on the small things is very, very important. It's not tiresome. It's not tedious. 
it is safe for us. And then he tells us what he's been tedious over. What he's instructed this body of Christians to, uh, to, to do. What, he, what message he's given them over and over and over again. And look, we're going to have, through, the, through chapter 3, we're going to have three threes. That's what we're going to look for. Here's our first three. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. He gives them three things to be aware of. To, to be aware that around you, these things exist. This is something that he's repeated. It's something that he's been repetitious in. He's been tedious over making sure that they understand to beware of dogs. Now, I spent nine years as a manager with FedEx. I hate dogs. I hate dogs worse than any mailman could ever hate a dog. All right? But here, he's not talking about the physical animal of a dog. What we see is throughout Scripture, and especially in the New Testament, there's this running talk of dogs. And what this is referring to is almost a subhuman class of person. Not because of their heritage, not because of their birthright, not because of their nationality or skin color or their income or their last name or anything else, but rather that these people have a below human instinctual relationship with the flesh. They act like animals. They act like animals. Now, Dogs are one of those things that we all think about the good dog. And we always think about good old Lassie helping Timmy get out of a well. And, and we think about you know, the, the kind little lap dog that yips at everybody and doesn't mean any harm. But in their true nature, dogs themselves are scavengers. They go out and they chase down and eat dead stuff. Here they wander from place to place. They, we think they're loyal, but they're loyal because why? You feed them. They know where their next meal's coming from. They're your best friend until you stop feeding them. When you stop feeding them, what happens? They trot on down the road to the next place. Or when it gets that special time of year and in the, in the air, they start to smell a certain thing, and what happens? See you later. They trot on down to wherever they want to go. See, dogs are animalistic, and animals always have two things on their mind, feeding and breeding. That's the two things that they always have on their mind is feeding and breeding. That is the marker between a human and between an animal. The funny thing is, is that God created humans to be humans in his image and animals to be animals to be useful to the humans. We've never seen a dog paint a Rembrandt painting. We've never seen a fish build a house. We've never had any of these things. God gave, didn't give them thumbs. They can't hold hammers. They've never paved roads. They've never set up civilizations. They are concerned with two things and two things only, feeding and breeding. And my friends, today in our world, there's a lot of humans who have debased themselves and brought themselves down from a human level of which God has intended for them to be. God has designed them to be, to think about generation upon generation upon generation, to worship God in all of his fullness all the days of their life and then die and go and be with him. And a lot of people have debased themselves to two things, feeding and breeding, about their belly and about their sex drive. And that's all that they care about. Paul said, beware of those people. Those people who are more animal than they are person. Those people who are conniving, they're scoundrels, they're, they're schemers, they come around when they think they can get something off of you. But, but man, as soon as you turn your back, as soon as you're used up, they are hot trotting on down the road. You beware of dogs. Then he says, beware of evil workers. Now, this evil workers, uh, you know, it'd be easy for us to think he's talking about, you know, magicians or something, you know, some, some wizardry that's going on. But the words evil workers can easily be translated in the same way to mean worthless teachers. Worthless teachers. In the same way, he's writing to the church about worthless teachers means that there's probably worthless teachers in the church. And in American Christianity today, there's a lot of guys who are going to get up on Sunday morning. They're going to look polished. They're going to have great suits on. They're going to have pressed khakis. They're going to have the penny loafers shine to a T. And they're going to get up in front of the church and say 
nothing. And teach nothing. And give a TED Talk, give an inspirational thing, give some therapeutic moral deism, just some good life hacks and tips and tricks. But they're not going to say, thus saith the Lord. And they're not going to say, this is what God instructs. And I will tell you, friends, that in the American church for generations now, we have been full of evil workers, worthless teachers. Your life is short. You need the instruction of the word of God and you need it alone. It will sustain life. It will give you life. It will inspire you. It will teach you things about God and the world around us. We don't have time for empty sermons where they just simply use their, their jokes. They, they tell stories about their families. They try to endear you to them. But in the end, you don't learn anything about God and his word. When we come together, it's to worship God and to receive instruction from his word. Not life hacks, not tips, not tricks, not jokes, not stories. It's the word of God. Beware of dogs. Beware of worthless teachers. And then he goes on and he says, beware of the mutilation. Now, literally, what he's talking about here is those of the circumcision. There was this, this, this schism in the New Testament church early on because they are Judeo-Christian. Uh, when Paul would go in to found a church, he always started by founding that church by preaching in the synagogue to the Hebrews, to the Jews, to those who already had a base knowledge of God. And then he would move on and begin to evangelize the Gentiles and pull the Gentiles into the church where it had this base knowledge of Judaism there because the early converts were almost always Jews. And so those who had a family lineage, they had an experience with God. Man, mama and grandmama and great-grandmama and granddaddy and great-granddaddy and great-great-granddaddy, they all grew up in this faith. And now this was this new thing. And these new people come into our thing. And we look at those new people coming into our thing. And we say, you know what? You got to be just like us. You need to look like us, dress like us, do like us, celebrate like us. You got to have these same holidays that we have. You have to have everything. We just need to Jew up the Gentiles. And they started to say, you know what? Number one of the biggest things that you've got to do is you can't go to heaven if you're not circumcised. Paul says, beware of them. Now, what's funny is Paul actually begins to mock them in their requirement of circumcision. And we see it here where when he calls it the mutilation, he doesn't call it circumcision. He actually calls it mutilation. So instead of a cutting around, which is what circumcision means, Paul actually uses a word that means cut off. I'll let you draw your own conclusion what he's talking about there. Go to Galatians chapter 5, and he actually spells it out and makes his own argument where he tells them that if you're so trusting in a little bit of cutting, I just wish that you'd graduate and just go ahead and cut it all. Like, if a little bit of cutting gets you there, then a lot of cutting probably helps you get there faster. Paul is making a mocking gesture towards them of their confidence in the flesh, of their belief in the flesh, that in this cutting, in this outward sign of an inward condition, they have more confidence in the outward sign than they do of the inward condition. Now, what does that sound like in our Baptist world? That sounds a lot like our baptism, doesn't it? Baptism is an outward sign of an inward condition condition. And we have a lot of people today in the Christian South, in the Bible Belt, who are trusting more in their church membership, that are trusting more in their baptism, and are trusting more in a fictitious prayer that they repeated in front of the church, uh, trusting more in a walking the aisle and taking the pastor's hand than they're trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, paying the penalty for their sins to where they receive grace instead of of justice where they receive mercy instead of their just due earned punishment and then that they begin to live a life conformed to the image of Christ. And instead of saying, I know I'm saved because I know I'm saved today, they start to get into this weird datism and they start to say, I know I'm saved because 17 years ago, 
I know I'm saved because of a date that I wrote in the front of my Bible. I know that I'm saved because mama told me at four years old. I know that I'm saved because I got baptized at one time. And none of those things are the marker of salvation in Scripture. The marker of salvation in Scripture is that I know I'm saved because I know I'm saved today. Not that I was, but that I am and that I'm going to be. That I have faith today and I have faith going forward. It's not some back date where I can check it off and cross it out. And I can circle that date and say, I'm secure because I know on this day that I was sincere. I know on this day that I really meant it. I, mean, I know on this day that I, I really believed it. But rather that today I believe it. And today I'm living by it. And today I'm doing as best as I can. And today I'm as conformed to the image of Christ as I possibly can be. And I'm so much better than I was yesterday, but I'm not even close to how good I'm going to be tomorrow. That's the testimony of our faith. That's the security that the believer can rest in. It's not of something that is gone by that I can place my faith in something backwards but rather that I can place my faith in how I'm doing today and how my future is determined. So he tells them, he says, beware of the dogs, beware of the worthless teachers, beware of the mutilation. Those who just have confidence in their flesh. They have confidence in some sign, in some symbol that they think means something, but they've lost the deeper meaning of it. Then he goes on, he lays out his resume. He says, man, if anybody should have confidence in the flesh, it's old Paul. It's me right here. He says, for we, who's he talking about? He's talking about the Christians. For we, the Christians, are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. What does worship mean? Does worship mean that we uh, sing songs to him? Does worship mean that we just simply attend church? Does worship mean that we just simply do some good acts, some good deeds of service, that we have some good works on our agenda? No, worship means that everything in your life is determined by God. Worship isn't something that we engage in, but rather it's how we orchestrate our life. A lost person can sing songs to God about God, but a, wor- but a lost person cannot worship him with their life. That's what we can. Worship involves obedience or worship is not worship. It's just a song service. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus, not in yourself, not in your last name, not in your mama's name, not in grandmama's faith, not in anything else, not in your church attendance, but you rejoice in Christ Jesus and you have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Now to us, that don't mean a whole lot. But whenever they went through this this type of civil war in Israel, there was only two tribes who stayed loyal and stayed more true to the scriptures that were part of that southern kingdom. And, And those two were Judah and Benjamin. He said, my family got it right. These other ones joined in with all these pagan tribes. They were led away into slavery and captivity. They joined in. They interbred. They intermarried. Man, they had all these pagan holidays and pagan influences and pagan philosophies. Not my family. We were a good family. We were a Bible-believing family. We were a great family, man. We had all the we had festival of, of trumpets. We had festival of booths, man. We had the Feast of Weeks. We had all of those traditions. We got it right. Everybody else's family? Mm-mm, not like my family. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You can't get more Hebrew than Paul. You can't get more Jewish than Paul. He says, now concerning the law, concerning the reading of the law, I was a Pharisee. Boy, when it came time for Bible drill, first place every time. I've forgotten more scripture than most people have memorized. I just know it all. I've done it all. Been to the best seminaries. I graduated from the best schools. I mean, you just might as well mark it off. Nobody could be a better person than I am. I've got it. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, 
And for the Hebrews, man, it was all about zeal. And it was all about excitement. It was all about passion. And he said, concerning that, he was like, I was persecuting the church. I was so given over to my lifestyle. I was so given over to my beliefs that I was actually persecuting and harming those people who profess Christ. Everybody else just didn't like them. I talk a little about them. They say they're funny, you know, dress a little funny. And they start some rumors about them. I was actually trying to kill them. Concerning righteousness in the law, blameless. I mean, you couldn't have took me to court and convicted me of anything. I'm obedient straight down the line to that law. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I've counted for loss. Yet indeed also I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Here's our second set of three. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the righteousness of the dead. So Paul says, you can't get any more Jewish than I am. You don't have a better family name than I've got. You don't have a better education than I've got. Like if there was anybody who should be proud and should be boastful and should say, you know what, of all of these sinners, Lord, you should save me. He said, it's me, Paul. But he looks and he says, all those things that everybody else said were gain, all those things that everybody else said were important, he said, man, I actually treat those as trash compared to the name of Christ. So guess what? My last name doesn't save me. Christ saves me. My church membership doesn't save me. Christ saved me. My, my, uh, my heritage and what mama did and granddaddy did and great granddaddy laid the foundation of the church and all that kind of stuff that people like to throw out. You know, mama grew up keeping the nursery and daddy taught Sunday school and all that. Man, that don't save us. Christ saved us. In the same salvation that Paul experienced, is the very same salvation that the worst drug offender, sex offender, murderer, any filthy animal that we could possibly think. The same salvation that Paul experienced is the same salvation that they experienced. Paul needed Christ just as much as every prisoner in the prison. Paul needed salvation just as much as every drug addict out on the street. Paul needed salvation as much as every derelict parent needs salvation. Paul needs salvation just the same. And in the same way, each and every one of us, no matter how good and how moral and how decent we think that we might be, we still need Christ. That's the entire book of Romans, guys. It's him writing to the Hebrews saying, you still need Jesus. He just summarized in a path, in one, in one paragraph, the entire book of Romans, where he's just constantly tearing apart their faith and telling them, you ought not to be so proud. You think you've got all these things to be proud over. You should be mournful over them. You had a head start. You had the law. You had the prophets. Instead of thinking that you're greater than the Gentiles, you should actually consider yourself less than the Gentiles because they're coming into it without the head start, and they're equal to you. He says, not that I have my own righteousness, that's from the law. He says, but there's three things that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. The reason why the resurrection is a big deal is because dead stuff don't come back to life. The resurrection showed that he was bigger than this world, or rather that he was outside of this world. Everything that exists are subject to three laws in the world, which are uh, time, matter, and space. In that, he's outside of time, he's outside of matter, he's outside of space. He is above creation. Even though he was in it, he was still above it. He was 100% man, but 100% God at the same time. The, the resurrection matters because that shows that he is God. He says, 
the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. He suffered for us. We suffer with him. Being conformed to his death, we die daily. There's less of us. There's more of him. We're continuously repenting and continuously being made more and more in his image. That's the whole process of sanctification that begins on the day of your justification and ends at the day of your glorification. Between your salvation and the day that you die, you are constantly in engaged in becoming less like you and more like Christ. And he says that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. He's looking forward. He says, not that I've already attained or already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has already laid hold for me. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Forgetting the things that are behind, reaching forward to the things that are ahead. That's how he lived his whole life. Paul didn't show up and just say, all right, everybody should listen to me because let me run down my resume. Let me run down all the good things that I've done. Paul said, no, let me tell you what about today. Let me tell you about what's going on in the future. So he presses on towards his upward call. But look at verse 17. He tells us, he says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have for us a pattern. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven. The first thing that he marks out is he says, guys, listen, there are goodly examples before you. And so in that, if we're new to the faith, if we're struggling in the faith, even if we're uh, semi-established in the faith, even if we think we got it all figured out, that there are still good and godly examples before us and all around us that we should try to live up to. Now, what we always try to do is instead of living up to the godly example, to the goodly example, very often we want to try to justify our own sin by pointing to somebody else's sin and say, oh, well, brother so-and-so, he thinks he's so great and everybody thinks thinks he's so great, but you know what I know? I know that uh, the other day, taking out the trash, he kicked a dog. And they always want to look, and they always want to find some flaw, some something that they can twist, that they can manipulate, so that they can tear down the character of somebody else, so that they don't feel so bad about who they are. Here, Paul says, no, 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 that's not a Christian activity. The Christian activity is to look and to say, you know what, brother so-and-so has a great marriage. I want a marriage like his marriage. Hey, brother so-and-so, how do you have such a great marriage? What do you believe about marriage? What has God taught you and trained you about marriage? Show me in the Bible what you believe, what verses you base your marriage off of. Brother so-and-so has great children. And we look and we say, all right, brother so-and-so, what have you done well? What would you give advice to me? How would you say that I should raise my children? What did you stress? What did you not stress? Did y'all have like certain rules? What, did they have certain chores? At what age did you begin uh, spanking and correcting? Uh, you know, like we should glean off of the goodly and godly examples all around us. Paul literally says... Brethren, join in following my example. That takes some courage. Paul not only says, imitate Christ, he also says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's saying, you can look at me and you can live by my example because, man, I'm going to try to do the best that I can possibly do. I'm going to press forward. And with that, I'm going to live in such a way because I know that there's other people who are looking at me for my example and that they are hopefully going to surpass me in holiness, in righteousness, in obedience to God. So I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to set the bar high. I'm going to live in such a way that they try to achieve the high standard that I set for myself because the standard for Christ that he desires for us is even beyond that. And I'm going to try to be a good example. I say all the time, man, if my boys turn out like me, I failed. I don't want them to be like me. I don't want them to be like me. I want them to be so much better than I am. I want them to be such better men than I am. I want them to have an understanding of the scriptures that far exceeds my understanding of the scriptures. And I ain't even wanting them to be pastors or preachers. I just want them to be good, godly men who know the word of God better than their daddy does. 
And so with that, everything that I strive for and everything that I stress for and every example that I set for them, I'm setting for them, not for them to live up to me, but for them to surpass me. And in the same way, within the church, the godly example that I try to set for the men in the church is not so that they can be like me, but so that they can be even better than I can. Because I have hopes and I have dreams and I have expectations for the generation coming behind us to be better than we are. And only to be exceeded by the generation coming behind them. That we continuously become more holy, more righteous, more conformed to the image of Christ. So that the generations behind us can achieve better and can achieve more. I want them to stand upon the shoulders of giants and become giants in their own right. But he tells them, he says, you follow the example. He said, but you also need to watch out. Still talking about discernment. He says, For many walk who I've told you as a pattern, many walk as I've told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven. For which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Guys, the first set, he talked about dogs, he talked about evil workers, he talked about the circumcision. That's all pressure inside the church out. Here, he's talking about pressure in the church from the outside in. Here, he's actually talking about the lost world around them. This persecuted church where they live, this nationalistic, highly military, highly, uh, you know, uh, pro uh, the Greco-Roman way of doing life. And he's telling them that they're suffering persecution in this place, in Philippi, in that place culture because they're saying Jesus is king and they're saying no Caesar's king and he told him he said now look outside the church and here's what we suffer from here's what we face in the world around us here's our third set of three number one they're enemies of the cross of Christ they're enemies of the cross of Christ It's not that we have saved people and then we have just this big, ginormous uh, amount of people who are just neutral. They're just playing spiritual Switzerland. They're not picking a side. They're not really getting engaged in anything. They're not really for Christ, but they're not really against Christ. Here Paul says, no, they are enemies of Christ. So often we want to play the game of, well, I'm not against Christ, so I'm for Christ. But what did Christ say? Christ said, either you're for me or you are against me. There's no gray. There's no, there, there's no neutral. It is either you are for Christ. Either you are advancing the kingdom. Or you are fighting against the kingdom. He says there's a lot of people out there. Who are just flat plain enemies of God. They've declared war on him. When he came in the flesh, they crucified him. And when he comes again, they'll try to crucify him again. But this time, he's coming as a lion, not as a lamb. This time, he's coming as a conqueror, not as a redeemer. And so, in that, he says, they are, uh, they are enemies of the cross whose end is destruction. And what do they serve? They serve their belly. They serve their animalistic instincts. The lost world out there, they hate our God. Now, why would they ever love us if they hate our God? Why would they ever be our friend if they hate our God? If they hate Jesus and they hate all that he stood for, if they hate our holy book, how do we ever think that we should be accepted in a world that hates everything good about you? He says, whose God is their belly? They just serve themselves. They just serve their belly. Man, if they're hungry, if they grumble, they go whichever way, however they can please their flesh, however they can tickle their carnality, however they can just get a little satisfaction for a slim moment in time. That's all they're concerned about. No eternity on their mind, no uh, end in sight, no reaching the world around them, no salvation, no humble, no obedient, no anything. Just radical rebels, enemies of God serving their flesh. That's the world in which we live in, whose glory is in their shame. 
Well, I tell you, if we don't live in a culture that glories in their shame, I don't know that there's ever been a culture who gloried in their shame more than America did. I don't even know if Sodom and Gomorrah could, could be put on a moral equivalence with America today. Sodom and Gomorrah, we, we see the, the raping, we see the murderous, we see the, the, the uh, giving over to carnality and the homosexual lifestyle, but we don't see them murdering their children. We don't see them completely given over to carnality. We don't see just a lewdness and a perversity on parade. At least they waited till the sun went down before they started marching through the streets and doing shameful things that ought not to be spoken of. Here we have a culture that celebrates pride. And the pride that they are proud of is shameful. He says that they glory in their shame. They glory in their shame. The things that they ought to be ashamed of, the things they ought to whisper about, they shout and cheer. And they demand that you shout and cheer for that as well. They demand that you glory in their shame or else then you are being bigoted. You're being hateful. You're not loving. You're not loving your neighbor. To love your neighbor to hell is not love. To love them straight into hell is not love. To see them, their soul endangered and not speak of it is not love. It is cowardness. And it has affected the American church more than anything else. We've become kind cowards instead of speaking the truth in love. He says they glory in their shame. They set their mind on earthly things. It's all about this world. It's not about the world to come. But then he looks at the Christian and he says, Christian, your citizenship is in heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven heaven. We're not defined by this culture. We're not defined by this land. We're not defined by anything other than heaven and heaven itself. You belong there. Now, as a citizen of, of America in the earth, in the flesh, uh, when someone from America gets off a plane in India, they kind of look a little different, don't they? They talk a little different. They look around at the food. The food's a little bit strange to them. The culture, the dress, the drab, all that stuff is, is different. It's odd. It's weird. Why do we feel so at home in this world? Why have we become so accustomed to American culture as American culture has become more and more increasingly carnal and we just still feel at home in it? We still feel right about it. We celebrate their holidays, we dress like they do, we talk like they do, we watch the shows that they do, we listen to the music that they do, we carry out our education the way that, that they do, we, we, uh, uh, we get married the way that they do, we raise our children the way that we do. We are completely conformed to American culture as American culture has left God and somehow we have not become strange. We have not become weird. To the world around us. For the majority of America. They couldn't pick out a Christian from a non-believer. Not because the non-believers are so good and so moral. But rather because the Christians have become so conformed. To the world around them. Be ye separate. Come out from among them. And I will receive you. Be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Christian. Your citizenship is in heaven, not in this world. It's okay to be weird. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be odd. We're supposed to be that. Why? Because we ain't from here. We don't belong here, and we ain't staying here. We're just visiting. We're passing through. We should be a little different. We should be very odd. We should live our lives completely separate from this lost culture that's all around us. So friends, I tell you, to be aware of the lost world around us that are secular, that are carnal, that are led by their, by their desires, that we should come out from among them, that we should trust in Jesus' righteousness, not in any of our own flesh, of our own works, of our own righteousness, but rather that we should trust in His shed blood and we should conform our life to His life. 
And then also that we should live our lives inside the church and we should beware of dogs and we should beware of worthless teachers and that we should beware of the mutilation, of trusting in our flesh to accomplish what only the shed blood of Jesus can accomplish. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, Father, as it speaks so richly and wisely to us. Father, we pray that it would convict us that it would move us, Father, that it would show us our sinfulness so that we can repent of it. Father, that it would show us your righteousness so that we can walk in it, that we can be conformed to, to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, more today than we were yesterday and even more tomorrow. Father, that we can shine your light into this dark world. Father, we can stand out and we can be different and that we'll see a great harvest of souls for your kingdom and glory and honor to your name, not to ours. Father, we pray that you humble us, that you help us to be obedient. Father, that you would guide our hearts and guide our ears and guide our eyes. Father, that you guide our mouths. Lord, that we can speak the truth and love to the lost and that we can live a life that's glorious to your name until we end up in glory with you forever. We pray in Jesus' name only. Amen. Won't you stand?